Hi guys, it's Ariel. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. If you guys are all doing well, welcome back to Monday Chit Chats. Today is a special one because I spent the last five hours going back through my photo archive two podcasts ago when I was talking about all the places that I'd lived in France. Um, someone had commented, we need to see the photo of the mountains with the sunset in Grenoble. And I was like, why don't I just show you guys the beauty of all these cities that I've lived in and to give you an idea of where else you can travel in France aside Paris because there's so many beautiful places. And so yeah, to, in today's video, I want to go through that slideshow, give you guys some little fun stories and anecdotes about the time I spent in Grenoble. And if you guys like that part of the podcast, then we can keep doing it for the other cities like Aix-en-Provence, Toulouse, Angers, Pays de la Loire, all of that. So you can let me know down below if you enjoy that. Um, first up, a quick recap of last week. My gosh, you guys, it was awful weather. I'm like, I'm so thankful that today it's like sunny. I'm sure you can see the sun in my apartment and stuff. But um, yeah, last week it was pouring rain every day, every morning. I would just wake up, stare out the window and be like, mm, gray skies and rain, amazing. Like it was awful. So I didn't get up to too much. I mostly just like worked on itineraries and I have to do a lot of research and writing for the next Bonjour Paris um, webinar that I'm doing. I think it's in about two weeks, 10 days, something like that. It's on the 18th. Uh, when I have the link, I will put it down below. That way you guys can buy tickets if you want to come. It's free for members of Bonjour Paris and then it's 10 euros for um, everyone else. Again, I can, I can feel, I can already feel the tears coming. And the problem is too, I clip parts of my podcast to put on Instagram for Instagram Reels. And every time I edit them, I look at it and I'm like, Ariel, your makeup is so smudged. It's awful. I can't believe you're putting this on the internet. But uh, yeah, it's just, it's just what happens with my eyes when I smile. Take it as a compliment that I enjoy doing these so much. But yeah, so another thing that was interesting that happened last week is I was at an event that I'm testing to put on one of my itineraries. And one of the events at this event or one of the activities was a virtual reality exploration of like the bird's eye view of this building and so Jean and I signed up we were doing this activity and everything at this event was in French including the instructions for like the virtual reality and the description of the event and stuff and there was a couple American families who were visiting Paris and who didn't speak French and who were totally lost and were like what did they say? And so I just started translating so that they understood how to like use the equipment and stuff. And um, we got into having this conversation during the event and then like after the event as well, they were, you know, like just the classic, where are you from? How are you enjoying your trip? Bop, bop, bop. And then they, they say, I bet you get this all the time, but where would you recommend to go and eat? What would you recommend to go and see? And I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you can look at my future website. But um this one family in particular, I thought it was so interesting because they were telling me about the restaurants that they'd eaten in. And they were like, we've had, you know, mostly Thai food. But other than that, we did have a couple crepes. Um, but yeah, it's just mostly been Thai food. What would you recommend as a restaurant or a place to go tonight? And I was like, what? You came to Paris and you have had only Thai food? And I'm like, there's nothing wrong with Thai food. But I'm not so sure I would like go to mostly Thai restaurants in France. Like French cuisine is, I mean, top tier. It's some of the best food in the world, right? And so I was thinking I maybe need to make a video on different types of foods that you can try or like identify on menus that are really good French foods, but that you might not know what they are if you don't speak French. Like the first example that came to my mind was riettes, which is sort of like, it's like the texture of pulled pork. So it's pulled pork, but it's conserved, like it's in a jar and it's obviously cold. And so you have it at the apéro, you have your baguette and you just spoon out some riette and you put it on bread with a little pickle and it's delicious. But it's something that because the name is in French and it's not commonly eaten in North America, I feel like people don't gravitate towards that on a menu or know to order it. And so there's a lot of confusion, I think, around French food and that's why people end up at Thai restaurants, but it really made me think about 
what useful content I could make for you guys. I would love to know what your favorite French dish is. Maybe I can include it in that video, but I thought it was very interesting. It was interesting, it was helpful for me, for me too as well because as you guys know, I'm like working on these itineraries and this family in particular, they were honestly so lovely, um, but this family in particular, this was I think their second or third time in Paris. And that's the second tier of itineraries that I'm making. I'm doing like first time, second, third, fourth, fifth time, and then experience Paris like a local itinerary. And so I was just envisioning them as being the type of family that would be like that would benefit from my second tier itinerary. And um, yeah, it really confirmed this for me because they were telling me things like the museums that they were doing, the restaurants that they had heard about, like things like the Louvre, um, l'orangerie and Les Deux Magots, which are all very, like very touristy points. So I was very surprised that a family that had already come to Paris was still doing like the surface level tourist things. And so yeah, it really validated me <laughs> in my idea of making these itineraries, but it was honestly very interesting. Oh my gosh, you guys, I put out the apartment transformation video last week as well. I would love to know what you guys thought, I did read all the comments in the video. I tried to respond to all of them. I know at least three or four people suggested that we move our couch and turn it so that it's facing the TV. And I love that idea. You guys, that was the first thing we tried when we moved in. But the problem is there's not enough space between our dinner table and the wall to turn the couch. So I'm going to try it in the next apartment transformation episode so that we can all see and like assess whether or not it looks good. Another thing too to keep in mind is we really want to get rid of that couch. I love the color. I love the green velvet, but I bought that when I was a single girly living in Paris and now we are two in this apartment and the couch is just really thin. And so it's hard for us to both relax on the couch and watch TV or play video games or whatever. So we want to get a wider couch for sure. And also that one, it it technically is a pullout couch. Like you can unfold the top of the couch, but the problem is there's no legs. So if you lean too far on one side, the whole thing tips over. And because we plan on having guests in the future, like my parents, Jean's parents and George and Zidke from Greece, I am dying for them to come visit us. We need to have a proper pullout couch so that we can host our friends and family. So all that to say, this couch is not forever. Uh, I definitely have to put on Le Bon Coin and sell it. And then we have to find a new one. And it, that's going to be a process in itself. But um, I do like the idea of turning the couch. Honestly, that's what we wanted in the start is to be able to face the TV. Um, but another thing we thought of as well is that the huge windows, like, like our the side of the apartment that I'm facing right now, like, over there in front of the TV are just huge windows. And so we also had the feeling of that if the couch was turned away from the windows, you're kind of missing out on the natural light and like the beautiful view that we have from our apartment. So that was the thought process. Let me know what you think. Another thing too that we have coming in our next episode is that we want to paint the bedroom. The bedroom is so bad. That's why I haven't shown in any of the recent videos. It's just so ugly. Like I'm embarrassed of how ugly it is. Um, and it's just white walls, white bed, white bedding, white desk, white drawers. <laughs> it's like so boring. Um, so we want to paint the wall. I was looking at a couple tutorials because I'm not an artiste and neither is Jaws, so we want something easy. So we're thinking of doing like a checker wall where it's white wall and colored checkers. So I think that's what we're going with. I want to get green linen bed sheets. So we're thinking of painting the wall yellow. I feel like I'm spoiling too much. I really want you guys, I, I'm sure the next transformation episode is gonna be so good. So I don't wanna spoil it too much, but that's kind of the vision. That's what we have look to look for it too. And obviously that corner needs some transformation. You guys already know if you saw the video, but yeah, I would be curious if you have any other comments about our apartment or the transformation stuff. Um, I did read the ones about the couch though. I am keeping that in mind. Okay. The only other thing I have, I, I can't smile. I cannot smile. The only thing I have on my list of topics is sorry that my hair is gross. <laughs> I think it looks actually okay at this moment but when I was, um, brushing it before I sat down. It's just like so greasy and so dirty. Um, 
And it's because I'm working out almost seven days a week, between six and seven days a week, and it's impossible to find the perfect hair wash day based on like when I wanna film and stuff because literally every day after the workout, my hair is just a greasy, sweaty mess and I can't wash my hair every single day. So yeah, that was the last point on my, on my list. Before we get into your questions, let's get into the slideshow. Um, I'm going to obviously look at the slideshow on my laptop as I'm talking, but I'm also gonna have it, like obviously all the pictures on the screen so you guys can see. I'm so excited. I almost cried going through these photos when I was making the slideshow because this was, oh my God, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> this was the most transformative year of my life. In the moment and even today, I just remember this year as being the happiest time in my life. Not that I'm not happy now, I'm obviously very happy now, but it was my first time really living in France with French people at a French school in a smaller city and I was young and crazy and I met the most amazing people, like truly the funnest, kindest, most amazing people. And it was just this, all of that combined was the perfect recipe for an adventure. So, uh, oh my God, it was, I really, oh my, I'm gonna make cry now, I can't, I have to stop. Okay, so first, photo on the slideshow is me at the airport with my mom and dad. This is actually, these are my favorite photos, especially the one of me and my dad. This is just me ready to, <laughs> ready to leave my family behind for a couple months. And um, like I said, this was like the first time that I went to Europe by myself for an extended amount of time. And I was kind of winging it. Obviously I had done the paperwork, I had the visa, I had the, the school administration stuff figured out, but I didn't have an apartment. I didn't know anybody over there. I had no friends that were also doing this exchange. It was a school exchange between universities. In Europe, it's called an Erasmus. In Canada or North America, it would just be um, an international exchange. But yeah, it was my first really big adventure in Europe all by myself with so many unknowns. Okay, these next two photos, this was, I'm pretty sure, the second or third day that I arrived in Grenoble. We, I guess the school had organized this event for all of these, all of this inflow of international students and students doing Erasmus. And one of the first activities they organized was this trip into the mountains because Grenoble is a city surrounded by mountains. So it was a trip into the mountains uh, with a day hike and an evening meal. This is where I discovered the Crozyflet that I talked about a couple podcasts ago. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite French meals. And you guys know me, you know that I love nature. Being in nature is like, it makes me very emotional. It makes me very happy. I love the city, but being in nature really does trigger something very emotional for me and it's so just being here for the first time in these mountains i i couldn't believe this was my view like coming from toronto coming from ottawa these are cities with no mountains in sight and to be here on my first or second day was crazy and then this is a photo of the hike that we did so you can see the valley between the mountains it was beautiful and we came across so many herds of sheep, cows, horses. Again, as a city girl seeing this, I was, I was in awe of all of the animals that we came across. This is the view from my apartment. Like I said, this was probably the most chaotic part about my time in Grenoble is that I had decided I didn't want to stay in these student dormitories. I wanted an apartment with roommates because the student dormitories, you didn't have roommates. You were by yourself in a dormitory on campus for the most part. And I was like, nope, I want roommates. I want to live in an apartment. I want to live the real French life. And so I ended up staying in, oh my God, I blew so much money. It was, 
at the start it was definitely a regret because it was overwhelming to have to even spend three nights in a hotel with all of my things and suitcases and just trying to get organized while I'm going to school in this new city. But after about three or four days, I did find a landlord that would rent to me. I paid him in cash. I didn't have guarantors. I don't even think I signed a lease. <laughs> like it was kind of a mess, but I chose this apartment for the view. You can see it's beautiful. It's just waking up to this every morning was beyond magical. And this is the kitchen of my apartment. And one of the most amazing girls I met on this trip, Pascal. Pascal was my partner in crime on this trip. Like her and I were like this. We were both single girlies. Pascal was adventurous. She was creative, artistic. I want to say wild, but in a really positive way. And she brought out she brought out the adventure in me. Like, there were so many trips we went on. There were so many little activities we did because Pascal had thought of them or had seen a poster with it advertised. And so she, I was, I just, I was so lucky to have met her and really her and I were in several. I mean, this, this was just one of a hundred dinners we had together in my apartment. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is young Ariel probably a month into <laughs> my trip and I just gave myself a fashion makeover. I bought a coat. I bought those shoes. I was like, I am, I am going to embody the essence of French girl. <laughs> and I just, yeah, I transformed my sense of style for, <laughs> for, for that year. Um, this is the photo that I was describing in my podcast a couple episodes ago. So this was campus. This was campus at dusk. You see the mountains in the back. You see the faculty buildings and the pink and blue sky. Again, this was one of those moments for me that were so emotional because I just couldn't believe that I was so lucky to be going to school in this place, to, to have that be my reality. It was so beautiful and I felt so free and I just... In this moment, I just felt so lucky. I don't know how else to describe it. Again, another photo, a little close-up of the faculty building. Those trees were huge. I think it comes across in the photo, but they were these huge pine trees. Very beautiful. This is the campus in the fall. Grenoble is very similar to Canada. It's one of the only cities in France where I've seen this transformation in the autumn season, where a lot of the leaves turn red, yellow, orange, and you have like a beautiful fall scenery. You don't really get that in other cities in France. It really did remind me of home. This is Pascal and Alexandra walking to class with me. And you can see here my face. I was shocked, surprised, happy to see these beautiful leaves. It really was so gorgeous. This was us having lunch on campus. We pretty much packed a lunch almost every day to eat at school. French classes are very different from the North American experience where you might have, like if you're an art student, you might have one or two classes a day. You might have one day that's full classes. Another day, there's only one class. In France, you really did spend almost every single day, all day on campus in class. So either you ate at the cafeteria or you brought your lunch, but you couldn't really go home and make a lunch. So yeah, this is just us eating outside, enjoying our little lunch. Another stunning picture of the campus. Again, I'll say it again. I could not believe this was my life. I was just overwhelmed with the beauty. <gasps> Please, can we look at the snow? Look at the snow. This is the only time in France I've ever seen snow similar to what we would have had or what we have in Canada. You don't really get snow in Paris. You don't really get snow obviously in the south. Grenoble, really, this was the first time and the only time I've ever experienced true snow in France. So this was campus. This was the little tram that we, well, I didn't take the tram, but the tram that you could have taken <laughs> to, to come to the campus. Here's another one with those huge pine trees just covered in snow. The whole campus covered in snow. 
Now, when I say I really didn't take the tram, I didn't use any public transportation in Grenoble for the most part, because on our fifth day in Grenoble, Pascal had come across this shop that would rent you a city bike for, I think it was either seven or 15. I don't know which one, but it was a cheap amount of money for an entire month. So we immediately rented these bikes and rode them absolutely everywhere. And this was another aspect of city living in Grenoble that made me feel so free because you could just travel anywhere you wanted, anytime you wanted on your bike. And I really mean anywhere. Obviously here we have Pascal who is riding her bike to school. We have me on the back of Pascal's bike. And then the first photo on the left is us biking to the club. So we really did bike everywhere in Grenoble. Here's another one, a little photo shoot. I don't know what this was on campus with our friend Felix. They were The city bikes were these flashy yellow bikes and you would just see them everywhere because everyone was renting them. Here's another one that just instantly makes me smile. Um, it's Sam on the back of Pascal's bike, us biking home after going out one night. <laughs> Again, it, not, all of, not all of our friends had bikes, so very often you would stick someone on the back of your bike and ride home. These photos, again, these were very, this was another jaw-dropping moment for me, okay? This photo is taken from the parking lot of the grocery store. Again, I, I couldn't fathom, at least in the early weeks, I could not fathom that something so normal as going grocery shopping, you would have this kind of view. Here's another one with the snowy peaks, immaculate. This is us on our second hike. Again, Pascal had gone to the tourism office. She had got this map of hikes you could do. She'd figure out a bus that you could take for two euros to get you to the small mountain village and then you could walk to the most beautiful viewing point. I'll show you guys this. We were above the clouds. You could see the mountain peaks. It was so surreal. But what is hysterical about this hike is that there's obviously more snow as you get further and further up into the mountains. Like on the hike, you were obviously hiking upwards. And no one was really prepared to hike in full snow. We were somewhat prepared. I had my Blundstones, Pascal had hiking boots. We were also with Alexandra. I think she had running shoes. So we were somewhat prepared. We had packed a lunch and everything. But we ran into these group of boys from Paris who had literally got off the same bus with us in this small village. So we hiked up with them. They had shown up in jeans and dress shoes skateboarding shoes, kind of a fancy running shoe with an absolutely flat sole. And we're hiking this mountain in the ice and snow and these boys were just falling all over the place. Nobody got hurt, obviously, but it was the the funniest thing. I cried myself laughing on this hike because they just they they were just slipping all over the place down the mountain as we were coming back down. You guys can see in the videos and stuff. It was just, you, you can literally see a man who is in full hiking gear. And if you like contrast that with the Parisian boys who had these like dress shoes, it just was <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> Whoa. This is the very first time I went skiing ever in the Alps. The first photo is me in the bus. The second photo is me atop. Again, at this point in my life, I think I had like an iPhone 4. So picture quality, not great. These photos are from seven or eight years ago. And so yeah, this was my first time skiing. You can see Pascal and I here getting our ski rentals. The second photo is me doing a slope with my ex-boyfriend. <laughs> but what was so good about Grenoble is that obviously you're very close to the mountains, but you can also get transportation to the ski ski resorts, the ski stations uh, for very cheap. There's a lot of public transportation, so I obviously don't have my license. I don't have a car. We were relying on the buses to get to the ski stations. 
but also they had really good deals, especially for students for ski equipment rentals. So I think the total to rent these for 24 hours was 30 bucks. I think the, not even, I think it was 15. The lift ticket was maybe 25 and the bus ride was five or 10, something like that. So it was very, it is very affordable to ski. And especially when you live in a city like Grenoble, or if you stay in a city like Grenoble, you're so close. It's, skiing is just such an affordable hobby, I guess you could say. And my first time skiing the Alps was wild, wild. I obviously grew up in Toronto. So I did a little bit skiing with my school when I was, I want to say 13, 14. And so I'm used to these little baby hills in Toronto, no mountains, nothing higher than a couple hundred meters. Okay. I get to these Alps where it's like 3,500 meter altitude. Okay. It was so high to even get up took us I want to say an hour. There were so many chairlifts to get to the top of the hill. And going down the hill took minimum 40 minutes. It was just so long because you were so high up. And it was unlike anything I have ever done before in my life. People, like I know a lot of people who ski in Toronto. My brother skis at Blue Mountain. And I'm just like, if you like skiing, you need to try skiing in the Alps. It's such a different experience. The slopes are truly massive okay the ski stations have 30 40 different ski slopes it's just a different kind of sport even i would say it was so there was so much adrenaline such an adrenaline rush and then also i mean the the party atmosphere on these ski hills and these ski stations is a whole other story as well like six or seven points throughout the ski station you have these huge restaurants with these big terraces and DJs and bars. And so when people have their lunch or afternoon beer, it's a whole ambiance in itself. So I highly recommend. And like I said, it's pretty affordable to ski if you're staying in a city like Grenoble where you're really close to the mountains and you don't have to pay to stay at a ski chalet or ski resort, for example. A group photo of us all together at the top skiing. Here's another picture of Grenoble, the city. They had these little eggs that you can see there that took you all the way up to the Bastille, which again, you could either hike up or take the eggs up and it gave you a view of the whole city of Grenoble. I think I have that next. Yeah, so this is me at the Bastille at the top, still wearing my little French coat really trying to channel French girl energy. You can see the beautiful mountains in the back, stunning. The city of Grenoble is obviously all the lights below. Here is a picture to show you guys as well. The colors, the vibrant colors of autumn in this city. You have the city down below, you have the canal that runs through. Really just is a very picturesque city in my opinion. Another photo from the top, you've got the mountains and the sunset. Okay, and then as a funny, a little fun anecdote, I thought I would talk about Oktoberfest. For anyone who's never been, I'm going to show you guys a couple photos. But this is what I'm saying. My time in Grenoble was crazy. We did so many crazy random things that I probably wouldn't do now as an adult. Um, but we decided to take a 12-hour night bus from Grenoble to Germany. I forget which city don't kill me, but we took this bus to Germany. So we slept in this bus. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the bus. I wish I did, but it was just, I think we went as a group of 10. So we just occupied the first 10 seats on the upper deck of this bus. And we didn't, we didn't sleep. It was party, snacks, funny stories, laughing. I really wish I had a photo to show you. This was the entrance to Oktoberfest. That was our little group. I did buy the Drindel, the dress, the <laughs> the 20 euro version of the Drindel that they sell to tourists at the entrance. And this is me with the Oktoberfest beer. Huge. I was shook it. Another group photo of us inside one of the tents. The boys also bought the male version of the Drindel, the, what the men wear <laughs> in Germany. Um, but theirs were such better quality. Mine was like this polyester ill-fitting dress and theirs were leather so there was definitely a difference in quality between the men and the women but 
This is another picture of inside the tents. The way that Oktoberfest works is it's about, from what I remember, I will say that week end was a bit of a blur, but from what I remember, it was a bunch of very large, I don't want to say tents, but you know, you know what I mean? Those, like if you have a wedding outdoors and you buy those big, what are they called? I don't know. I forget. We'll say tent. Large event tent. And you've got hundreds of tables, thousands of people drinking, enjoying snacks, listening to music. Here's another view. This one's more like a building. Another group photo in our tourist outfits. One thing as well, Oktoberfest, you, there's a DJ playing crazy music and everyone gets on the tables and dances. That's what I'm doing here. And then this is the funniest part. These We're wrapping up the slides here, but this is where we stayed when we went to Oktoberfest. We stayed in these tents. And I don't know if you can see the ground, but the ground is wet. It rained all night. And so we, again, like just crazy things I don't think I would do now as an adult, but we booked these tents for maybe 25 euros a tent for one night before we got back on the 12 hour bus. And so I think it was Pascal and I staying in a tent. It was two per tent. And I just remember coming home and the ground was wet. The tent was wet. Everything was soaking wet. <laughs> and it was just this unreal. It really was a 36 hour unreal experience between the 12 hour overnight bus, the crazy Oktoberfest, the night spent in a wet tent and then immediately the 12 hour bus back home. It was wild. I don't recommend, I don't recommend. I mean, I do recommend, but if comfort is not your priority. So that, that is my slideshow of Grenoble and Oktoberfest. I hope that it gives you guys a new idea of some place that you can travel in France, especially in the winter. I, I have so much love for the city of Grenoble. I... I think it's a beautiful city. I think if you enjoy nature, if you enjoy hiking, if you enjoy mountains, then it is the place for you to go in France if you have time to add it to your trip. Um, let me know what you guys think and I'll do another slideshow for another city. But yeah, let's get to your questions. Strata Banya asks about student visas for bachelor international students. Oof, girl. It has been a very long time since I've had to deal with the issue of student visas. What I will say maybe as a tip for if you're applying for your student visa is to plan for that as early as possible. So obviously getting the documents together early because you don't really know how long people are going to respond. You don't really know until you see the list of everything you have to provide. You don't really have an idea of how fast you're going to be able to get that paperwork. And for me, I know in terms of getting transcripts and stuff like that, it took a really long time, especially the hard copies. So if you if you know you're coming to France to study as a student, make sure you, you do give yourself the time to apply properly. And as well, I think that one thing that really was always a problem for me was getting my appointment. And the issue that I had, I remember on my second time I was applying for the student visa, is that there weren't any appointments before my flight. So I wasn't even sure that I was gonna be able to pick up my visa before my flight. So again, you can apply or you can, you can book your appointment up to three months before the expiry of your visa or yeah, three months before the expiry of your visa to get your new one. And I would definitely max it out on, on the first day possible, go and apply for your, go and book your appointment because from my experience, there wasn't a lot of availability and it really jeopardized my trip and finances because I would have had to rebook flights and stuff like that. I don't know if that answers your question, but um, let me know if you have like a more specific question. Paul, who is Jean's friend, wants me to talk about the topic of Jean. <laughs> I think I talk about Jean enough on this channel, honestly, and I don't want all my content to be about my relationship, but you guys know I say it all the time. Jean's the best. He is the absolute best partner. 
I could have found. I tell him all the time that I'm just so lucky, so thankful for him. He supports me in everything I do, and I just could not find a better guy. Not even close. Sean is the best. <laughs> Fatima says, what are some tips for people traveling that have low energy in the morning or have health issues? Hmm. I think when it comes to low energy, something that I have recently discovered about myself is um, two things. Number one, I have stopped putting my phone by my bed. So when I wake up in the morning, the first thing that I do is not to reach for my phone and spend an hour scrolling in bed. Um, I think that helps me get up in the morning. Um, another thing too that has helped me with energy, especially now that I'm sort of starting a weight loss, fitness, health journey, one thing I find that gives me a good energy boost is to eat proteins for breakfast. I know that sounds very gym bro -y, but I'll have things like cottage cheese or eggs, I can't think of other proteins that I have at the moment, but but I find that when I eat protein in the morning, I do have a lot more energy throughout the day. When it comes to health issues, I do have two points. Number one, come prepared. If you guys watched any of my grease videos, you would know that I had a pretty severe reaction to an acidic fruit. I forget the name of it, but this fruit that I had tried for the first time in Greece, I ate it when it wasn't ripe and it started to make my throat swell and it was terrifying because I it was something like midnight I had no way of getting to a hospital I didn't even know what was happening to me because I had never had this fruit before but what I learned from that experience is that I always want to be prepared when I'm traveling anywhere with something like an allergy an over-the-counter allergy medication or on that same trip to Greece I got my fingers so seriously infected that I had to have an operation. I wish I had packed little bottles of disinfectant gel. I just, I really wish that I had been more prepared when it comes to my health. Another thing I will say is well, when you're traveling and if you know that you have health issues, make sure you look up the emergency phone numbers for the country that you're visiting because it's not 911 all over the world, okay? In France, you dial 19, for example. And um, yeah, just make sure you know the emergency number in the city or country that you're visiting in case you do need help. Brittany has two questions. She says, you have to take a train from Paris to another country for a weekend away. Where are you going? Train, ooh, hmm. Oh my god, there's so many places I would pick. I mean, you guys know I want to visit Austria and I want to visit Scotland, both of which you can access by train, even if the train is very long in the case of Scotland. But to change things up, mm, I think I'd probably take a train to Spain. Oh <gasps> No, I changed my mind. I would take a train to Switzerland. Oh my gosh, the time I spent in Switzerland was amazing. Again, mountains, beautiful everything I love and the landscape was out of this world in terms of beauty. So I would take the train to Switzerland for sure. I've only been twice. Once my company paid for like five days at a ski resort in Switzerland, which was amazing. It was amazing to not have to fork over any money for that experience. And the other time is when I went with Pascal and Caitlin, the girls that I'd met in Grenoble. And we went to, I want to say, I don't know. I don't remember the name of the, the city, but we went to the mountain town in Switzerland where there's the longest footbridge so that we could cross the footbridge. So I've been there to hike. I've been there to ski. I would love to go back to Switzerland to enjoy more scenery, maybe do a more scenic train ride. That's definitely on my bucket list. But Switzerland is so expensive. I remember there the hostel that Pascal, Kate, and I stayed in, like a literal hostel with bunk beds, cost us 60 euros each, which is almost 100 Canadian dollars. And this was 10 years ago, so I can't even imagine the prices today. 
And then Brittany's second question is, what is your dream job? Do you have any career goals for the next five years? I'm not going to lie. I have to say what I'm doing now is definitely a job for my dreams. It's definitely the hardest I've worked in my life. I pretty much work seven days a week, obviously varying amounts of time. Like on Saturday and Sunday, I'll probably work two or three hours a day. So it's definitely the hardest I've worked, but it's the most rewarded I've felt. I think I said this before in another video, but I adore learning. I've always loved school. I've always loved university. And I found that when I entered the professional world, I wasn't learning anymore. I wasn't reading. I wasn't researching. I was doing work that led to things like business development and financial gain and none of that felt rewarding to me and so now to be exploring the city of Paris in such a deep way to be reading so much about the history not only of the city but the buildings the monuments the architecture everything is just so fulfilling to me I love it and I also really like the social aspect of creating videos and posting them online. I obviously love the creativity behind thinking of video concepts and editing, but I also love doing things like this podcast where I feel like I connect with people who have the same interests and values and ideas as me and responding to your comments and stuff. It's all of it. This job in general is so rewarding to me and I mentioned this as well when I started doing my itineraries is that having another goal like building a website building a product is a whole other world of creativity that I'm really enjoying so I would say when it comes to my goal for the next five years I definitely want to grow I want to grow from what I'm doing right now with the itineraries. I don't know what I'm gonna grow into, but I do have a couple ideas. I think it's so hard to look five years in advance, but I have to say two things that I'm really enjoying doing. One are the webinars with Bonjour Paris. I love giving talks on subjects. I've always loved giving presentations and, and making PowerPoints and stuff. So I would love to do more of that in the future. And I'm also really enjoying building these really creative itineraries. So two things I hope to develop and only time will tell, I think, how that will go in five years. My gosh, you guys, I have talked for so long. Ah, I hope this was okay for you. I hope the slideshow wasn't too, too boring, too much. You guys will have to let me know down below in the comments. But yeah, thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys have a great week. Thank you again to those who submitted their questions and I'll see you on Saturday. I think it's a good one on Saturday. <laughs> okay, bye.